Serverless relational databases are finally here with the announcement of Aurora Serverless V2. V2 has a lot of performance improvements over V1 that make it a viable candidate for production use cases. We'll talk about that and more in this video, so let's get into it. First, let's talk about Aurora Serverless V1. This isn't anything new. Aurora Serverless V1 has been out for many, many years. However, it wasn't really a production viable service to use in your production applications. The reason being is that Serverless V1 wasn't really meant for production in the first place. It did support auto scaling, but the scaling increments were very, very choppy. So you'd have very large increases and very large decreases in response to fluctuating traffic. In addition to that, it wasn't very good at scaling up quickly. So if you had a burst the workload where you had many requests that came in all at once, you kind of be out of luck. And the last performance problem was the fact that if you have many requests that are hitting your database all at once, in order to scale up, Aurora Serverless V1 would wait for an instant in time where there's no queries running against the database before it would decide to scale up. I don't know about you, but if you have a large application with many customers, it may be difficult to find a point in time where you don't have any running queries. Another really big problem with Serverless V1. That wasn't all the negatives though. It did have elastic auto scaling where your storage was distributed across multiple different availability zones, which increased its availability. However, V1 wasn't really designed for production. Even the AWS documentation says so. The AWS documentation itself suggested to use Aurora Serverless V1 for developer use cases, such as maybe you want to spin up your database when your developers are in the office and working and then spin it down in the evening. Aurora Serverless V1 was excellent at that. In fact, it would scale all the way up when you needed it and then scale all the way down to zero and cost you nothing while the database wasn't running, besides the storage, of course. So that's a little bit about V1. In summary, it wasn't really meant for production. Now let's talk about V2 and why it's such a big deal. V2 has some pretty large improvements over V1. In fact, in my opinion, the whole purpose of V2 is to make it a production viable data store for your applications. But let's dig into a little bit more of what it offers. So remember when we talked about V1 with that slow scaling in response to fluctuating traffic? Well, that's solved with V2. The scaling is much, much quicker. And in the words of the AWS documentation themselves, an Aurora V2 database can scale from zero to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of transactions in just a few milliseconds. That's a pretty impressive feat for something that advertises itself as serverless. It also gets all the benefits out of V1, including that elastic auto scaling for your storage portion that's distributed across multiple nodes. In addition, you can also run your Aurora Serverless V2 cluster in a multi-AZ architecture. So for your compute tier, you can distribute your compute across multiple nodes too. Pretty neat for increased availability across the board. Another neat thing about V2 is that it makes it really easy to switch between the serverless and the provision mode. And in fact, in the console, you can switch between the serverless and the provision mode just by clicking a couple buttons. Very easy to do and an excellent choice for experimentation. But not everything is perfect for serverless V2. There's two critical downfalls that you need to know about before deciding to use it for your application. The first is that it's not necessarily serverless, so to speak. When I hear the word serverless, I think of pay for what you use. So for example, when we have Lambda functions in AWS, you don't pay anything when your Lambda function isn't being invoked and you just pay for the number of invocations. It's not quite the same with Aurora Serverless V2. You have to have a minimum of 0.5 Aurora capacity units activated at any point in time. That may not sound like a lot, but it actually translates to about 40 US dollars per month in automatic overhead. So that's compute infrastructure that's always on that unfortunately you as the user need to pay for. Is it serverless? Kind of. It's kind of straddling the line in terms of what we traditionally think is serverless and what AWS is thinking of serverless. So that's drawback number one. There's a consistent overhead for using Aurora Serverless V2 and it costs about $40 a month. The second major drawback is that it does not support, at least at this point in time, the data API. The data API is an incredible feature by AWS. It makes it so that you do not need to connect to your database directly in order to perform queries against it. Instead, you can use AWS's HTTP client to submit queries against the database and get your response directly through an HTTP response. This is great because it solves the problem of connection management and connection pooling. Typically in the past, people solved this by using RDS proxy or some kind of connection pooling software. Using the data API, this is a lot easier. And unfortunately, at least right now, Aurora Serverless V2 does not support the data API. So if you're relying on it currently in Aurora Serverless V1, you're kind of out of luck. Hopefully they add this feature in the near future. 
Now you do have the option of selecting Aurora Serverless V1 and V2. However, I do expect V1 to be phased out over time as AWS devotes more resources to V2 and continues to invest in it. On that note, tell me what you think. Is Aurora Serverless V2 actually serverless? Is it blurring the line between what serverless means and what it is and isn't? I want to hear your feedback in the comment section below. Thanks so much and I'll see you next time.